in Johannesburg, there's a mother I know who has twins. And she has named one twin perfect, and the other twin is called excellent. And in our family, we have a debate, as if one had to choose which child one was, would one rather be perfect or excellent? And this is a question which I'm going to pose again later on in the, in the lecture. I always think poor children to be given either name like that, but that's who they are. That we are that we're seeing here is of Lev Theremin, a Russian musician and scientist, playing his instrument named after himself, called the theremin. Now, if you watch it, you can see that the the left hand dips down, and that controls the volume. So when you go down into it, it goes off, and when you lift it up, the sound comes. So you play different notes by dipping it, and your your right hand, yeah, your right hand controls the pitch by how far and close you are to the antenna in front of you. So you have one circular antenna and one vertical antenna, and it has to do with magnetic disturbances in an electrical field. And it becomes a real mixture between a scientific invention and a piece of, a piece of music that is playing. It's extremely impossible to play. I've tried to do it, and it's, it's a sound that became very famous in science fiction films. You can hear it, and you can imagine the science fiction films of the Martians coming down to land. I bring that up as another know to think about in relation to what I'm going to be talking about, uh, a companion piece to the question of the twins of perfect and excellent. And the nature of this lecture is going to be threefold. The one is that it's a report of a work, a work that was uh, made for the Istanbul Biennale this year and which is still running in an island off the coast of uh, Istanbul called Buyukada Island. So it's a description of the making of the work. Secondly, it's an aid memoir to myself of the elements that didn't make it into that project, which I'm thinking about for an expansion or a second work that may develop out of all the ideas un unrealized in the first work called O Sentimental Machine. And the third one is using the project, the Sentimental Machine project, as a way of testing the studio as a forum for thinking and a mode of thinking, and using this as a kind of concrete example to try to test what kind of knowledge one can gain in the activity of working in the studio. So to begin at the beginning, an invitation to participate in the Istanbul Biennale, um, and specifically to do a work on the Buyukada Island. This is Trotsky's house, what remains of the house of Trotsky, who is in exile in, um, in, in Istanbul, in Turkey, from the years about 1929 to 1933. The house is a ruin. You can see what's, what's left of it now. But the invitation from the curator, Carolyn Kristof Bakarjev, was to think about this place and this island, particularly as I'd been working before on a project which had to do with Bukharin, and the absurd in the Soviet Union in the 1930s, and to let this be another meditation on that, on that question. The house itself, as you see, is not really a site which can be used itself. It's literally falling, falling down. And so the invitation was to move to this hotel, which is a few hundred meters, maybe a kilometer, half a kilometer away, and to think of that hotel. So these were the givens. These were the starting points of the project. The idea of Trotsky, the idea of the ruined house and the idea of the hotel. And the question then is how does one bring these different pieces into the studio and see what is viable, what can expand from them? What are the associations that spring to mind that they project, that they push outwards? A hotel that looks like that, what are the 
images that come with it. And of course there are obvious ones. One thinks of holiday, holiday hotels of oneself. Think of the hotel in Death in Venice, of that grand idea of the European hotel and the luxury surrounding it. This, this image, in fact, is of the first floor landing of the, of the hotel, which in the end was the space that seemed the most resonant to work with. It's a working hotel, and one of the things about the piece is it would have to be done with hotel guests using the rest of the, the, rest of the hotel. So again, it's now got a series of provocations of the spaces of this landing with the different doors, and many different doors immediately suggest a kind of French farce of who's coming and going, who's entering, who's, who's leaving. And these are ideas that come from the venue back into the studio in, in Johannesburg. But there's also the question of what is it to talk about Trotsky in Istanbul, and we'll come back to Trotsky in due course. At the moment, I was thinking, well, what are the immediate associations that one has of, of him? One has this paradox of the revolutionary in this holiday hotel on holiday. One springs to mind Frida Kahlo's eyebrows. One thinks of this combination of the cosmopolitan and the exotic. One thinks of the assassination of Trotsky, and one thinks of Andreo Nin, the, the Spanish uh, anarchist and sympathizer to Trotsky who gets assassinated in Spain during the Civil War earlier. And of course, from him, one thinks back to Anais Nin. So these are just the, the kind of the logical thoughts. In fact, the assassin of Trotsky was very distantly connected to Anais Nin herself. So then one puts together the political and the erotic, thinking of Anais Nin's book. So these are all associations that flow, flow out not from a study or a deep consideration, but they're immediately there floating. There are different parts of the brain in which the chemistries that make these different memories start being heated up and emerging, coming from the deep memory, where one's not thinking of them, to where they come into consciousness. This mess of ideas is really to put on the agenda the question of testing the virtues of loose thinking, not of focused thinking, but of, of wild thinking. Now, Istanbul and Trotsky in the 1920s, putting the temporal part together. This is images from, from Istanbul taken in the 1920s from a documentary film of the kind of images of a journey up the Bosphorus. Remember, this was the time when Turkey was becoming Turkey and changing from the Ottoman Empire. There'd been the revolution of Kemal Ataturk. Um, it still was very much connected to the remnants of its empire. There was a language change that went from um, Ottoman script um, away from that to a Roman script. But there were still all these kind of echoes of it, of seeing this world of what was there in Istanbul. This was the start of kind of consciously researching, saying, what are we going to find? How do we gather enough material in the studio to launch some kind of a, some kind of a project? It had to do also thinking about Turkey and that period and the period now, obviously very aware of Turkey both in the middle of the Syrian refugees, of its attack against uh, Kurds at the moment, of the historic uh, genocide of Armenians. All of those elements are sitting there and some of them may or may not come into the, into the project. But also thinking what does a militant secularism have to do? And one of the results of the militant secularism of Ataturk in the transformation of the revolution in Turkey was that he was sympathetic to the secularism of the Soviet Union. And so that when Stalin was looking for a place to send Trotsky, Turkey was one of the places that offered not Trotsky, but Stalin, a place to send, to send Trotsky. Now, Trotsky himself, these are images of him actually on that island when he was sent into exile. Home movies from the late 1920s. But to remind ourselves of Trotsky, he was Lenin's right-hand man in the 1917 uh, communist revolution, Bolshevik revolution in Russia. Um, he was the leader of the Red Army in the Civil War, the war that defeated all the armies trying to destroy the revolution just after the First World War from 1918 to 1921. 
And it was the period, this is the Tsar, the man walking naked into the water is the old Tsar of Russia with his family and friends having swimming. So this is the world that was being transformed. So here there was a kind of association of we're in the Bosphorus, we're in this waterlogged area outside Istanbul, water needs to come into it somewhere. Here is an image of the people in the, in the water. I mean, in the end, I don't think it didn't make it into the project, but it's a pretty remarkable piece of archive footage. And this is the end of the Civil War, victory parade in Moscow of uh, Soviet ar arms and tanks, um, when Trotsky was at the height of his power, second only to Lenin in the in the Soviet Union, in the, new, in the newly established Soviet Union, but soon to fall out after Lenin's death with Stalin. Stalin wanting a revolution in one country, Trotsky having an idea of a permanent revolution throughout the world. And this started to already gather a kind of language which could come out of history, so to speak, and sit itself in the studio. And it has to do with this movement from what is outside in the world to what one can bring into the studio, and what is the transformation, what is the work that is done in the studio to take it from these fragments of archival footage that were found in archives in different corners of the world to turn into something which becomes related to it and made from it, but not identical to it inside the studio. Here was another piece of archive that I found. Camarade. Vous voulez des mois, une réponse à la question. Pourquoi est-ce que j'appartiens à la fraction des bolcheviques léninistes qui est en opposition aiguë avec la politique actuelle de l'international communiste et du gouvernement soviétique So this is a piece of archive of Trotsky giving an eight-minute speech, but not in Russian, in French. He didn't get a visa to France, so he had to record it in front of a camera, and then that was sent off to make the speech for him. But one of the remarkable things, firstly, to have this complete eight-minute speech that I don't think has ever been used in any film or taken out of the archive before that was found in Amsterdam. And secondly, to say once it comes into the studio, it's a question also of saying, what are the kind of gestures that he uses? What is the grammar of the gestures of the 1920s, of that style of talking, of that emphasis? And it became clear that this speech, this eight-minute speech, with the different styles of rhetoric, would become one of the elements, one of the building blocks of the, of the project. There's also something in it which reminded me in the kind of gestures that one sees in uh, Marx Brothers films, which are also <laughs> from the 1930s, the period of this. This is, this is in the late 20s or early 30s. The height of the Marx Brothers films is the early 1930s. They were great favorites of both Trotsky and his wife when they were in exile to watch Marx Brothers films. And one tries to find in the rhetoric of the gestures, in the grammar of the hand gestures, a way of thinking about how one can proceed in it. Taking, as it were, separating the specific meaning of Trotsky's lecture, which we heard, to a kind of dance that starts to happen with him. Not in the sense of saying what he's saying becomes unimportant, but saying that for the transformation to happen, one has to take the elements apart and then see what new meaning they may make when they come together. So we've gathered together the theremin, which is the strange otherworldly instrument with a strange other set of gestures. You've got Trotsky's gestures, you've got the strange theremin double theremin gestures. You've got the cobbler in the archival footage beating his uh, shoe. And we start to gather a kind of hand gesture which can be used, which we've used in the project as it is, but which seem to suggest a whole series of possibilities to expand further in the, in the project. Now, here's another starting point, which has to do with the nature of the archive. We've looked at these different pieces of archival film, and this is, brings us to another one of the themes, which is always present in the studio, and that is the relationship between what we know that we know, what we're conscious of being aware of, and what is buried inside us, but which we also know because it emerges at different stages and different times. 
And one can think of the deep files of our memory like the archive which is buried. And the public archive becomes a metaphor for the kind of deep memories that we have that we don't remember. And I think that art is kind of exemplary in looking at this question of memory or archive and how it comes into the front and selectively used and how that gets constructed. And one of the points or one of the themes mentioned or one of the drives of the and aims and impulses behind the, the revolution of 1917 for both Lenin but particularly for Trotsky was to oppose the question of what is the nature of a human being and how stable is that human being? To what extent can they be improved? To what extent can they become perfect or is the best that they can become a kind of provisional excellence? So he was interested in the instability of the human being. The opera that I'm working on uh, at the moment at the Met, Lulu, is really about the instability of desire. But both of them written, you know, the similar period, the 1930s, both Lulu, Albenberg and Lulu, and Trotsky in Istanbul, are about the shift of what constitutes what used to be seen as a coherent person. So we stuck somewhere between Freudian psychology and neuroscience. So although this is in the 1930s, these feel like very problems that we deal with at the moment. To what extent is a human being a sophisticated machine? And to what extent can we turn a machine or a computer into a human being? Two sides of this question. Does one need a deep understanding of oneself to transform one's understanding and get rid of neuroses, as Freud would say? Or as neuroscientists are now saying, no, we can put a microchip in your neck over here and if every 20 seconds it gives an electrical impulse to your vagal nerve, uh, it will take away deep anxiety and the worst cases of depression, as if we are a mechanical object that needs to be oiled in a particular way. And these were very much questions of the 1920s, but they're also ones that seem to have echoes as we go on. It has to do whether one says consciousness can disappear and be turned into a mechanical thing, the moment we think of consciousness, but if we find the right chemi chemicals, we find what is the enzyme inside us, and it's apparently an enzyme which, when released in sufficient quantities, opens the pathways and lets the neurons which have got your old memories bring them into consciousness. So you can reduce it to a kind of chemical equation and a chemical process. Um, but we do also have the sense of fighting for consciousness to hold its own. So we know the situation where you can say to yourself, well, I know something is annoying me, but I should not be angry rationally, there's no cause for anger. And you do that, but inside the unconscious or the anger demands its say. Anger demands its place to come out. It refuses to be turned or allow itself to be that machine that can be described either by chemistry or by physics. Okay, here's another completely different starting point from the studio. This was a a test we did a while ago for a um, fragment in a completely different pr project, More Sweetly Play the Dance. I needed a typist typing, a stenographer taking notes for a politician giving a speech in a different project. And this is the improvisation that, the, that Sus Sue Pam Grant, the actress, was doing while we were... See, what are the ways in which it could get frenetic or what were the edges of it? So there's a lot of this kind of stupid work done in the studio, stupid improvisation. Not saying what does it mean, but saying where can it stretch to and what can it, what can it become. And here's a fragment of how it was used in the... So we had that fragment. That, that is one of the pieces that existed in the studio, this idea of this typist doing, and the thought that we'd used it in a very small way. You can see the difference between what we saw in the first improvisation and how it's very used in quite a staid way in the, in the film, and feeling that there was something to be developed. And there still is. We've used it in the current film, but there's a sense that that is still a work in progress. And in the studio also were several different kinds of machines that we've been working with for other projects. This is all about the, what's, oh, sorry, here we go. Before we get to the machines, this is 
out of order, but has to do with, again, bringing into the elements that, we, that are there in the studio. In this case, the archive of Trotsky making his speech and the thought about the water, the water in the, in the film, in the Bosphorus, and allowing that to become a drowning force. What happened to Trotsky the way he was the way he was taken out of history and taken out of what he was doing in the Soviet Union and a kind of drowning of his speech. So the, the idea of putting the two together became one of the elements in it. How does one take the, the archival footage of the speech and have a different layer that gets put in front, which in fact meant turning projectors upside down and projecting them through water, a whole series of specifically studio activities. And the same way for uh, the megaphone, the megaphone that had come into the project to see if one drowns the megaphone and the voice of the megaphone. And here it was already thinking about the rooms in the hotel. To what extent could they be filled like an aquarium? To what extent could objects be drowned as if each room, if you opened it, would be filled with the Bosphorus coming into it? So we made an automatic megaphone a megaphone that you could control with a mouse, with a mouse pad or with your arm, in order to think what, for a completely different project again, this was for a project which was going to be a chorus of these megaphones interacting almost as puppets, and it was in the studio, I thought, well, that's one of the things that exists in the studio, and there's something about a megaphone and the public speaking of Trotsky that said, all right, we can put his speech through the megaphone as one way of thinking, but also what does it mean to drown, or how can one drown the the object. And it also starts bringing the question of the machine and the human being together. If that machine starts having human characteristics, what does it start to suggest in the body of work that's being put together? Thinking of machines as both as puppets, as physical objects that one can manipulate, but also what, are the, what is the excess that they give us? What is the extra part of metaphor or image of association that comes from not a static megaphone, but a megaphone that has a kind of agency in how it moves through space? And this was, this was a continuation of various other projects which had been done with the megaphones. Here's the megaphone at its earliest at its earliest stage. Uh, one of the people in the studio managed to hack a PlayStation game and use its controller so you could move your arms and as you moved your arms, the uh, megaphone would move. And the idea was that it would be at a state of readiness that I could have a megaphone next to me here for the talk and have part of the speech here and part coming from it. But there are engineering problems we have not yet solved. So this image stands in for the next possible kind of iteration of a, of a lecture where one could at a certain point stop and it would continue on one's behalf and then take it. There's a whole world, there's a whole series of projects that are waiting to come from that. that will... These are other kinds of machines. Again, this is from the project uh, the, refusal of, the Refusal of Time. objects are objects which are part of the detritus of the studio, in much way that a lot of the archive footage that one gets is the detritus of an area, fragments that are left, traces of a kind of thinking that exist, existed. None of these are used in the project. This is an automatic... Again, the megaphone coming back. So it's memories in the same way that one thinks of memories waiting to enter into one's conscious thinking and to be used in understanding the world. It's these objects in the studio, either the objects or the traces of them, that are sitting there as a raw material and pushing to be used in the project. So Little movement here we that, started that combining more that way. typing. That's it. And then back to it, and then Sue, you can look at it. Look at the megaphone. Look at the megaphone, Sue. 
And then back to your typing. The megaphone's talking the whole time. Look more towards me, megaphone. That's good. And Sue, straighten your skirt. And megaphone, look at her. And start again. Okay, good. So we're gathering. Here's a start in gathering. We're putting together the idea of the mechanical megaphone and the typers coming together at the moment just because they're there in the studio and they have a kind of conversation. And we have some sense of public speaking from Trotsky speaking. And uh, the interest in a mechanical world, which is there from the, from the 1920s and 30s. Here's another object that was in the studio, not for this project at all. Now, there's something about the way that the megaphone has a double kind of bounce as it lands. It's not completely... It's simply a, a, a sort of hand drill underneath the sewing machine, turning on the sewing machine, with the megaphone balancing on it. But there's something about that double bounce that suggests the beat of a heart, where it's not just a simple heartbeat. A heartbeat is a sort of... And the movement of that suggested, all right, within this machine, within this machine, there was an organic thing suggesting itself. In this case, the heart. You can make it go slower or faster as one wanted. So we're gathering the pieces. We have the Bosphorus, the idea of water, of flooding the house, of flooding the hotel rooms. We've got thinking of these rooms filled of water, which of course reminds one of Alice in Wonderland and the Pool of Tears, a kind of domestic flood that could happen, of drowning in the Pool of Tears when she shrinks very small. Uh, we've got the idea of Trotsky fishing in the Bosphorus every day. His house was right at the seafront. We've got the glass doors, which we could put into the hotel rooms, almost like the glass walls of an aquarium. So we could have water behind the rooms, done as a projection in which different things either float or drown. We've got Trotsky underwater, we've got the megaphones underwater. We've got the typing, we've got the speech. And we now have a language, or we have a vocabulary, and what we have to push for is to say, what is the meaning, or what are the ideas in the world that can start to come out? It's almost like all the tendrils are out and they're looking for a foothold to construct, to construct something. What is the detritus push? I mean, so Trotsky talks about many different things. He talks about what's happening in the Soviet Union. He talks about what's happening in China, in Armenia. And so reading around this, there were many different fragments of Trotsky's speech which were there, still trying to find how can they connect to it. And then I came across a novel, a Soviet novel written in 1927, the same period, called Zavist, or Envy, by Yuri Olesha, which was a very popular novel at the initially and then was suppressed, and the author suppressed. And what caught me in it was its interest again in this mixture of men and machines and how they, how they interact. And this is, in the novel, it's completely a question of what can humans become after the, after the revolution. The idea was very much that humans should be seen as people, we should be seen as semi-manufactured products, was the term of Trotsky's. A human being is a semi-manufactured product, and if we correct it and oil it and change things, we will get a perfect human being that is ready for the new society. But in the, so in the novel, there is a machine that is developed called Ophelia by one of the characters. It's, a, it's an aside in the novel, it's not the main story. And this is a perfect machine. It can do everything. As he says, it can blow up mountains, it can fly, it can lift heavy weights, it can crush ore, it can replace the kitchen stove, um, it can do everything you want. It can make your breakfast. And here we have it in two directions. On the one hand, this machine becoming the perfect machine, but also at a certain point collapsing. Because the author writes, this machine is all doing perfectly. It's all doing perfectly. It can do all these things. It can replace the perambulator. It can blow up the Eiffel Tower. But then, in the words of the author, but then the slut, she starts falling in love, the machine. She starts singing stupid sentimental love songs of the last century, and the whole thing starts to fall, to fall apart of the sentimental machine, which is the other the other idea, the other side of what it is to try to turn the human beings into a programmable 
comprehensible and rational uh, being or machine. So this idea is, floats amongst many ideas, but what brings it into focus in the project is the fact that it's already there. It's already there in the megaphones that have been made for other projects, in the sewing machine that's sitting uh, in the studio, in the automatic drum kit that had been there from three years before. It suggests all this raw material, all the props, have some of them already been filmed, and they're there, and this is the theme that they latch onto. And that becomes the heart, the heart of the project. And then there are a series of experiments as it starts to hone in of thinking, right, if one thinks of the megaphone as half machine, half woman, can we do it? Are there different ways of trying to see, to have a moving machine? These are practical experiments, but failures. Um, in the sense we thought, well, can that skirt feel human enough? And the answer is it could not. It looks like a piece of cloth on top of a megaphone. But it does bring in, and what it brought in straight away, even the idea of combining the person and the machine, is the category of the absurd, of saying, all right, these are crazy ideas of the theremin, this machine that you play by moving your hands in this strange way, of having this perfect machine, but that then goes on strike and sings a song, of taking a human being and somehow twisting them into this perfectly manufactured product. We're in an area when I talk about the absurd of places where a kind of logic has gone awry, but in that dislocation of logic, there are kind of revelations about assumptions of power, assumptions of knowledge in the world. We're getting close. Different pieces are being made for the project in the studio. Still not knowing quite what it will be. This is a, a mirror that was constructed in the studio, obviously a kind of, a kind of fake mirror. Because from 1933, we have some of the great Marx Brothers films. And we know that Trotsky and his wife loved them. And I thought, well, 1933, which is the political of the Marx Brothers films, is Duck Soup. And this is, a, again, the biography comes into it because one of, it's one of the films that sits in my memory as a great one, and particularly the scene we all know of the Groucho Marx finding himself in the mirror and trying to decide if it is himself or not himself to see the empty mirror. So the mirror that we constructed was very much an echo of this, trying to play with that scene, trying to say, how can one bring duck soup almost literally into the, into the film? <laughs> and also saying there's a kind of manic comedy and absurd that one sees in this film and in other areas and testing how far can that go as a way of thinking about the world. This is again other rehearsals of raw footage when we were first trying to test out the idea, how would it work to make the, the double mirror. it always has to be filmed twice. So actually trying to work out how it could work or how it could start to bring a megaphone to the, to the actor at the same time. A lot of experiments are done and a lot of them are abandoned, but trying to see what they suggest, trying to pull from this detritus a new idea or if not a coherent idea, a group of images which seem to push to a a grouping and a coherence. This again was one of the just the tests of how does one physically, how does no, how does one technically, not physically, technically start mapping these different objects onto each other, a megaphone. So we discovered that electronically we could put a megaphone on top of the skirt or on top of someone else. And one of the things that obviously a mask like this does, because the megaphone is like a mask, is that it makes very visible the rest of the body, the gestures, all the other objects become so that fragment, which is not used in the project at all, is there as a memoir, memory, as an aid memoir to myself to say there were things in that mixture of archive and crude compositing to think about for the next, the next stage. 
Finally, we come to the work itself, taking all these different elements and putting them together. This is the landing, and this is just to give you a layout because we can't see it all. You can see there are doors off the, off the landing which have got glass windows put into them on which there are different projections and there's one central screen. And so what I will show you this evening is just the central screen. But on one of the screen, one of the doors to the side is Trotsky's eight minute speech. And it's a speech which is saying not such surprising things from it. He says things like, uh, comrades, help me to respond to the question, why was I part of the faction of the Leninist Bolsheviks who are in antagonistic position with the current politics of an international communist and the Soviet government? The essential goal of the Communist Party consists to establish a strong proletarian front line of class consciousness. In the Soviet Union, the Communist Party has all the power. The economic successes are indisputable. The number of workers in the country has doubled, it's tripled, and he goes on, both about the virtues of what has been achieved and the constraining of the world by, by Stalin. In one of the other screens, the screen at the side there, is the megaphone singing a love song, singing the machine, singing the sentimental love songs of the last century, as described in the book. And it's a, it's a Turkish song, which some of the words are, the past, I was also in love once. It burnt my life out, realized that it was worth my youth that I have lost. Though I yielded to her, she never became my lover. Eventually, I fell and died in the green sea of her eyes. Never slept on her chest, never had a kiss. Years have passed and she has forgotten me. Never held her around the waist, but never gave up hope. It is a sad story that took her away from me. She became someone else's lover and happiness. My heart has been in ruins since. So that's the, it's a wonderful Turkish song from the 1920s. Um, so those are, just to explain to you, those are two vital parts of the project that you can't see, but what I'll show now is the eight or 10 minutes of the, of the central screen. We can maybe switch off these lights a bit while the film is on. Oh, it's fine, it's fine, we'll manage. Pourquoi est-ce que j'appartiens à la fraction des bolcheviques léninistes qui est dans la position aiguë avec la politique actuelle de l'international communiste et du gouvernement soviétique Je vais essayer d'esquisser au moins les points les plus importants de la question. Le but capital du Parti communiste consiste à constituer l'avant-garde prolétarienne forte des consciences des classes. Au combat résolu, prêt pour la révolution. Mais l'éducation révolutionnaire exige un régime de démocratie intérieure. La discipline révolutionnaire n'a rien à faire avec l'obéissance aveugle. La combativité ne peut être préparée par avant. Thank you. 
next incarnation, not of this particular piece which is done, but of a project taking some of these themes and continuing. And to the question of the perfect and excellent, obviously this has to do with how much one can get rid of all that is destructive in people, in the hope that people would and the world would become a better place. And the answer of the, of the Dadaists, the answer of the Marx brothers and the other is, no, we have to accept that we're living in this completely a world which fundamentally is unstable and has a break in its logic deep in the heart that is not going to be restored and that the idea of perfectibility will never happen. The very idea of improvement, improvement is a term that is always used in these grand projects, whether it's the communist project or others of improving people so that they will be better. And the resistance to that idea necessarily of improvement, I mean, they say that parents are always looking for signs of improvement in their middle-aged children. And it does imply that the world is a kind of child. And as the, obs the observation of a very ancient priest when Andre Malraux, Malraux asked him if in all his years as hearing thousands and thousands of confessions he'd come to any conclusion about uh, human beings, he said, well, his only conclusion was that fundamentally there are no adults. <laughs> and what the work in the studio, I guess, is on that side, is saying that is the way and that is what is shown by these different pieces. And the question of laughing wild in conditions of severest distress becomes one of the questions of how one can continue. And for me, the, what started to emerge in that between the Marx Brothers, the combination of humans and machines was one direction that could be taken further. It's, it's part of the ongoing question of what is both the impossibility of utopian thinking, of the perfectibility of the world, and the gap that we have if we remove that, that element of utopian thinking. That space where neither is satisfactory. To proclaim an unquestioning uh, utopian vision in the face of history becomes impossible, but to remove it and say, no, no, we just, it's a question of manipulating uh, desires and market forces and that's all we will ever amount to is also equally impossible. And the area of first, I suppose, brought so strongly into the world by Dadaist artists a hundred years ago, but which continues either in the manic comedy of groups like the Marx Brothers, seems a way to go on. And I want to end just with two clips which are not used in the piece at all, but which also act as a kind of aid memoir in thinking about the relationship of hope, violence, and comedy. The one is a fragment from a film also made in the 1930s, uh, one, of the great, uh, one of the great series of films in the 1930s, which was the Betty the Boop cartoons. And Betty the Boop was a cartoon character in herself combined kind of a mixture of violence and the erotic and the sexy. And the other is to bring it back to that first hotel image 
of the hotel in Buyukuda Island, which had such strong echoes of the hotel described in the novel in Death in Venice, but which was particularly present in the film made of it. And there was a moment in that, I think, that from that film that was sitting in my head a lot of the time while thinking of the film, which still has to be developed further. So I'll end with one last uh, clip from these, from these films as a kind of goad to myself for the next stage of the, of the work. 